Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? We're about to do the recap and breakdown of UFC Fight Night. Brandon Moreno versus Amir Albazi, which just took place on Saturday, November the 2nd, 2024. We're going to start with the prelims and with the main card. Let's get right into it. It's pretty late. I need to get this done. Oh, we got to fix this from the stream. We're perfect. Let's go. Opening prelim of Jamie Lynn Horth versus Ivana Petrovic. Um, I had Jamie Lynn Horth uh, as a pick. Um... It was very close for first two rounds, one one apiece. I think Ivana Petrovic probably won the first round. Jamie Lynn Horth putting on a little bit of a pace inside that second round. Inside that third round, I thought Jamie Lynn Horth uh, did more damage. I thought she just had a little bit more output. Ivana Petrovic still uh, putting on a good enough show. Her sitting at a minus 200 favorite was a little bit chalky, but I did end up taking that line. Um, and Jamie Lynn Horth did end up winning. It was a really impressive fight. <clears throat> for both ladies, Jamie Lynn Horth doing the exact same thing she kind of did in the Veronica Hardy fight, where it, it it really seemed like the same fight. Wherever she, whenever she couldn't get uh, stuff going on the feet, she just shoved Ivana Petrovic against the the cage. And Petrovic, being also a very good grappler, tried the reverse position a couple of times, but Jamie Lynn Horth just seemed like she was a lot better um, of a grappler, especially against the cage. Just seemed like Ivana. Ivana Petrovic didn't really have a whole lot going for her. And then Jamie Lynn Horth kind of just took over in the later stages of the fight. Uh, being the smaller fighter, she had to get real, uh, really dirty, had to get in close. Both ladies were completely gassed coming in that third round. It was really rough to watch, but it is what it is. Could have been a robbery, but uh, it's not something to make a stink over. 29-28, either way, it makes sense. But I had Jamie Lynn Horth winning. Uh, we're going to move on next in the prelims. We have Cody Gibson versus Chad and Halliger. Now, we this went the exact way we all thought it was going to go. Cody Gibson, massive for Bantamweight, massive for the weight class. No way he wakes. Like he, he's 135 for two seconds. This guy's giant. He's 5'10", tied for the second uh, tallest <coughs> uh, Bantamweight in the UFC. 71 inches of reach. Chad just had no chance. The first couple uh, minutes, Chad looked nice. He was using his in and out movement very well. He was landing big shots on Cody Gibson, clipped him a couple times. Uh, in the third round, he landed a couple big shots because he was he, he had to. It was the only thing that he had going for him. But Cody Gibson just utilizing his wrestling, really um, stopping all of the power of Chad and Helger uh, and giving him no, no space to breathe. It's just Ch Chad's 37. He's turning 38 in December. He he, he's just he's old man it, it, it's he, you can visibly see he's starting to slow down even though he's one of those guys that utilizes his move he's kind of like dominic cruz the way he fights is his movement and the fact that he's starting to slow down gibson was able to just kind of catch him a couple times and uh step in with a nice takedown once or twice to where chad was getting really exhausted inside that second round he was getting really fucked up with a really grueling pace um arguably could have been a 10-8 i thought it was a 10-8 um and it was just tough. It was really tough to watch, especially because I don't mind Chad. I really was thinking about picking him this week. It's just Cody Gibson. He's 37 years of age as well. It's just he seems to be putting it on better. He's giant for the weight class. And if he really wants, he can move up to featherweight if he's getting older. And it would probably serve him even better. Uh, we're going to move on next to the prelim. Sari City versus Garrett Armfield. I thought City won the first two rounds. Now, people are arguing with me. People are mad at me saying that, how the fuck do you give City the first round? Dude, the power was coming out of City. Garrett Armfield was landing more, but I think the power out of City was a lot. Uh, the little bit of blood that City had wasn't a, a big enough thing, in my opinion. Uh, Garrett Armfield was getting pieced up inside that second round. Clear, I thought, for City. And then that third round came up and... Again, another toss-up. I don't know. Uh, it's really close. Could have been a... I think it might have been a robbery, honestly. Uh, it could have gone to Garrett Armfield, but I'm not mad at City, man. I, I I thought he fought a good fight, especially after that Ramon Tavares fight. I thought he deserved that fight as well. Um, maybe he gets it back with Karma this time. Garrett Armfield really uh, utilizing that boxing... I got a takedown too. He took City down. City couldn't do shit about it. He tried to get up. Garrett's like, fuck you. We're going to sit here for a little while. Um, took a round off him for that. It's just Garrett Armfield didn't really utilize uh, his power boxing as well. He he, he couldn't get in range. He, uh, City was using a lot of stuff up the middle, a lot of front kicks, a lot of jabs. He was popping him with it, uh, landing nice strikes. Garrett Armfield only losing to some of the better people up at uh, Bantamweight. It's just like... 
He even beat Brad Katona. It's just he, he has a problem where he's kind of one-dimensional, and whenever he shoots for a takedown, it's a little bit too late. I think if he would have shot a takedown early in the first round and maybe early in the second round, he would have won those first two rounds, and then he would have just had to deal with the, the pressure of City in the third, which isn't really that much, seeing as he clearly gasses after the second round. You can see him slow completely down. He's one of the few fighters I see that you can visibly see his hands get lower and he just gets gassed. So, Sari City's good, man. He just, I think he needs to work a little bit more on that cardio. I think the, the jab and the front kick would have been more money for him if he just threw it. His coach was even telling him everything down the middle's landing, stop winging punches. Kept winging punches. It is what it is. He just has to learn th th that he can trust his striking and, and get over a guy who's five foot six and doesn't have any business being even fucking near him. Uh, we're gonna go next on the prelims. Alexander Romanov versus Rodrigo Nascimento, and Romanov uh, basically showed up. Nascimento, Nascimento uh, again. This is the testing ground that we were talking about for Nascimento. <clears throat> I was talking about in the stream as well. Um, the first round was going to be a big test for Rodrigo Nascimento. Uh, this is the first time that he's ever fought someone that has really decent wrestling and is also really decent in the striking. Alexander Romanov looked like he had a lot better cardio than he did any uh, the last time around, uh, weighing at 261. Usually he's at max 265. He used to weigh in at 240, 235. Uh, he looked a lot better back then. I guess he really likes tacos and burritos like fucking Kevin Gastelum, or Kelvin Gastelum, excuse me. And yeah, he just doesn't give a shit anymore. He's 33 years of age, and I think if he dropped the weight and, and got jacked like Gelatin Almeida, he might have a fucking big shot at heavyweight because he looks really nice, man. He's mixing it up really well. Rodrigo Nascimento, nothing. There was nothing there. I don't even know how you give him a round. There was nothing there. There was absolutely nothing. He got taken down, couldn't get up. Got dragged back down. As soon as he got back up, got dragged right back down. He had the reach advantage. Could have been using that jab. Could have been utilizing the jab in the later stages of the fight. But was gassed. He was completely gassed. Alexander Romanov was the one doing all the fucking hard lifting. And Rodrigo Nascimento didn't... Like, dude, nothing. Did nothing. Exploded once in the first round, which I was happy about just to see um, if he was able to get up. Wasn't able to get up. So now we know that you, the second and third round, as soon as the round starts, you're avoiding all those takedowns. No matter what you have to do, stay away from those. If you have to give up a bunch of punches, get fucking rocked, whatever, you have to stay away from those takedowns because you're not getting back up. You can't win the fight on the ground. And he just led into a takedown after takedown. Third round came around. We're standing and banging. Alexander Romanov has his hands down to his fucking hips, and he's not even defending. And Rodrigo Nascimento can't do anything. He literally couldn't do anything. He he couldn't pop anything. He couldn't hit any nasty. He hit maybe a, a nice one two, uh, a nice left hook, and that was it. Uh, Alexander Romanov overtakes him. I thought thirty twenty seven. I think there was a twenty nine twenty eight in there. Whatever. A little bit pathetic of a performance by Rodrigo Nascimento, but now we know where we stand with him. Uh, just absolutely fucking atrocious losing to chris Dawkins as well is just fucking laughable did chris Dawkins lose again oh my jesus bro it's gonna be okay brother he lost to another black guy yeah he's lost what one two three four five five fights in a row to a black like this is like the biggest i know this is a fucking wild topic but seriously like it makes no, it's a wild stat bro He's been knocked out like th for what four times in a row, and then leaves the UFC, and then loses to fucking Tafel Ninjetsuku or N Ninjetsuki or Ninjekui. Jesus fucking Christ! This is the dude that used to be in the UFC. I remember this guy, bro. I Jesus Christ! He's just getting laid out by people from the U black dudes from the UFC. Let's fucking go. Chris Dawkins is just fucking awful, horrendous. One of the worst fucking. Pieces of work I've ever seen in the fucking UFC. Next on the prelims, we have uh, Yusuf Zalal versus Jack Shore. Um, yeah, Yusuf Zalal just overtook everything. Uh, very, very impressive, man. I, I don't know many Moroccan fighters in the UFC, uh, but he came out on a f on a f with a fucking mission, bro. Jack Shore had no business being in the octagon with Yusuf Zalal. Uh, landed a couple nice strikes early in the fight. Yusuf Zalal had his hands a little bit low. Would have liked to have seen him a little bit higher. Uh, Jack Shore, again, had a little bit of a intense fight with uh, Jordan Sinbrito, having a major cut on his shin, having to stop the fight. But Yusuf Zalal here gets a three-quarter Nelson... Or, no, sorry, this wasn't the fight. Um, ends up on top position. Uh, I believe it was in a scramble. Gets the arm triangle... Starts choking Jack Shore out, and Jack Shore doesn't even do any defense. He sits there, 
and doesn't even like do the fucking shitty defense where you like you post up with your shoulder and try and like move it up. He literally just sits there like this, and then right before he taps, he does this, and then the, just gives up and taps. And like uh, whatever, you you didn't even fucking try. You're definitely getting kicked. <clears throat> Excuse me, kicked out of the UFC for that one, probably. And getting finished for three times in the last four fights. Very impressive from Yusuf Zalal. A lot of improvement out of him. And I'm really excited to see what else he, he can do inside UFC because this is one of the few fighters that can make a second stint inside the UFC and just fucking go off. He has four, five finishes in a row, but three finishes inside the UFC. All chokes. Very impressive. I'm very, very, very impressed by him. His first round was a little bit rough, though. Again, keeping the hands a little bit low. If he would have had his hands high, I don't think Jack Shore imposed any threat. I think the uh, mix-up of uses the law was too much for him anyway, and I think it would have been—it just would have benefited him to not get cracked a couple of times. Maybe it woke him up a little bit to get hit, but, you know. Next on the players, we have Charles Jourdain versus Victor Henry. And luckily... Uh, Charles Jordan gets a finish that I was really, really hoping for because I, I, I wanted him to get it really bad. Victor Henry is getting very old. He's 37 years of age. Still looked good inside this fight. Not one of those guys that is putting on the age really badly. Uh, knocked out Yaya last time around, who's kind of on the fucking downfall. He should be out of the UFC if he's not already. Um, Charles Jordan, very impressive, bro. Uh, that guillotine was slick. Got it. Ah, fuck, I'm trying to remember the fight here. Uh, start. Oh yeah, th there we go. Charles Jordan, uh, kickboxing, landing really impressive shots inside that first and second half, or first half of the second fight, uh, second round. Excuse me. Uh, landing really, really good shots. Uh, the kickboxing was uh, f actually kind of unreal. He was chopping at the lead leg of Henry, uh, mixing up the shots, landing really clean, was stinging Henry with good jabs, good hooks, working the body as well. Just using everything he got taken down by henry was able to get back up really easy um i can't remember if this the first round ended with henry on top or not i, I i'm trying to remember the fight but I'm, it's a little bit blurry right now but charles renan again gets back in the wind column very happy for him especially out of edmonton uh it, it's a, a place out of his home country you know my home country as well we're just trying to get some wins for the canadians who are having a tough time especially in the contender series and regional scene we can't seem to get a fucking fighter uh to to get up in this um in this division we have uh who's i can't remember the other dude's name who just got into the ufc uh, no, he got knocked out, actually, in the first round. Never mind. He in contender series. Never mind. It doesn't matter. Uh, next on the prelims, we have uh, Eamon Zahabi versus Pedro Munoz, which is the top of the prelims. Um, Eamon Zahabi with one of the most beautiful uh, like fights I've ever seen in my life. He, he looked the best of the best. He looked incredible. People were saying he looked robotic and stiff. I think he just looked lock locked in. He looked like he was in a flow state, really good defense, uh, keeping his hands high, a very awkward defense, yes, but he was blocking majority of the shots from Pedro Munoz, landing big combos, damaging strikes, looked like he uh, hadn't even got touched until that third round started. Pedro Munoz was starting to put on the pressure and finally damaged Eamon's hobby just a little bit, but Pedro, Pedro Munoz, man, we got fucked up, swollen eye, bleeding completely down the right side of his face, uh, and, and lost a very, very heated fight where Eamon's hobby looked locked in man he looked like he, he he was in the most comfortable zone he'd ever been in in any fight i've ever seen him in it was it was actually incredible it was very very fun to watch because you're seeing a guy who overcame a guy like javid basharat overcomes a, a very well vetted man like pedro munoz who 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 was a very good gatekeeper granted pedro munoz is a little bit older but yava basharat's not old he's 50 he was 15 and 0 and and now you have him where Eamon's hobby is starting to land some incredible strikes where you're seeing the power in his step in and you're seeing pedro munoz get snapped back which is incredible especially you're seeing as he didn't even take this much fucking damage from like fucking cheeto or even dominic it was incredible in a three-round fight, too. Eamon Zahabi clearly having some power in those strikes, clearly having a large improvement 
on his uh, fight skills, and and I, I'm I'm really hopeful for him, man. I'm I'm really hopeful that I'm gonna see Eamon Zahabi back in the octagon soon. He looked really impressive, and, and I think he can be a, a big force at 135, especially seeing as he's turning 37 soon. He still has a couple years, man. Especially he can move up at featherweight, but I think 135 right now is good for him. Uh, we're gonna move on next in the main card. We have Mike Malott versus Trevin Giles. I love Trevin Giles, bro. Um, I do, but I picked Mike Mallott here, and and the reason why Mike Mallott wins is because Trevin Giles doesn't throw, and I don't know why he didn't throw. He, like my my brother, what the fuck are we doing here? We we have one of the hardest hitting one seventies in the division right now, and we're not throwing. Mike Mallott's face was red just from like twenty strikes from Trevin Giles. I'm not sure why he didn't throw. I, I, I really don't understand. I really would have liked to see the one-two out of him more. Mike Maw would have got pieced up, bro. He was getting hit up in that first round. He got cut open right away on the bridge of the nose. They had to cut uh, uh, close that. It wasn't big, but still, it's something like... It, Instead of just stalking and, and following Mike Mallott around, how about we do something? He didn't even shoot once. Mike Mallott shot once to make Trevin Giles drop his hands. One time. And I think it was in the second round. One time. And it was like the first half of it. We, we got to be fucking throwing these hands, bro. You have... Uh, you're literally, your name is the problem, bro. You have hands like I've never seen. And we're not throwing them. You took... You, you had a fucking... Competitive fight with Carlos Protest before you got knocked out. What are we doing here, bro? We can't be so tentative, especially when you're fighting Mike Mallott, who It's not like he's going to fucking throw hands with you. He, he's trying to get those kicks. <sighs> Jesus. Anyway, he's trying to get you on the ground, too. Like he, Most of his wins are by submission. Anyway, next on the main card, we have Dustin Soltzfus versus Marc-Andre Barriol. Uh, Dustin Soltzfus, whenever he gets Marc-Andre Barriol down, uh, Mark couldn't get up. Mark sat there for a long time inside that first round. I was like, oh shit, this is over. Um, this is just sad. Mark gets up with 50 seconds left. I was like, okay, this is this is, this is is where Mark is going to make it stand. Yep, we start swinging. Mark gets clipped twice, and I'm like, okay, Mark should probably back away right now. No, let's wait into the fire a little bit more. Oh yeah, and then the right hand from hell of Dustin Stoltzfus just sleeps Mark. Sleeps him. Puts him on his ass, and he's out. You can see his, he, he's, his soul's not even with his fucking body at that point. A couple more shots from Dustin Soltzfus ends it. Um, he gets a, a knockout victory, which I, I I can't even fucking believe, to be honest, because Dustin should not have won that fight. He's the type of guy that you would have thought that Mark would beat the shit out of. And now we're going to see Marc-Andre Barriel out of the UFC at this point. Um, I really thought he, he was a lot better than, than what I saw. I thought he had a little bit of ground game. I thought he would have avoided the stand and bang whenever he got clipped and it just showed that he has no fight iq at this point especially inside the 185ers man they're starting to get better and better and a dustin solstice who got knocked out by a, a fucking doubling double spinning elbow basically from uh bruno Ferreira is able to knock out a mark andre Barriel, who used to be one of the most fucking like one of the strongest hitting 185ers in the UFC. We used to watch this guy just fucking knock dudes out. Like Marquez, he knocked the shit out of Azatar. You know, in TKO, he's knocking dudes out before he was the champ, before he came into the UFC. It's just unfortunate to see him come down this road where he's 34 years of age. He's going to be kicked out of the UFC, and he's probably never going to win another MMA fight in his life. It's just how it is. It's it, it's just unfortunate. And Dustin Solstice is going to move on and fight better competition than Mark Andre Barriel will ever fight again in his life. We're going to move on next on the main card: Jasmine Jasavidia kiss versus Ariane Lipsky da Silva. Um, da Silva is lucky she didn't get knocked out because she was getting stung. She's very lucky that she got choked out uh, inside that first round. Jasmine was getting popped a little bit. Uh, it looked like she, you know, we all knew Jasmine had the had the wrestling. We all knew that she probably should be shooting on De Silva, seeing as De Silva has way better boxing than her. And it took until the second round for Jasmine to realize that's where she wanted the fight to be. Took her down to the ground, realized that that's where we're going to win the fight. And then the third round gets a half Nelson uh, or a three-quarter Nelson, slips in the Darce and rolls and gets De Silva to tap, which is really, really fucking impressive, seeing as De Silva doesn't have very many submission losses on her record. Um, one, there you go. That's her first submission loss on her record. She usually is a girl who gets knocked out. And and Jasmine Jasavidikas is a girl who can knock her out. And, and I'm surprised that it, in that third round, it wasn't a knockout. Because these girls were throwing ha hands. De Silva was getting clipped because she was tired after that all that wrestling inside the second round. And Jasmine just 
was putting a, a unbelievable pressure on her. I'm very happy for her. Jasmine's one of the uh, the, the girls I've been paying attention to for a long time, uh, especially uh, where is it? the Natalia Silva loss was unfortunate, but you saw a growth in Jasmine Vidicus, uh, and you knew she was going to come back better. The Tracy Cortez loss is a little bit of an L, seeing as Tracy Cortez is kind of not that great in my opinion, but it is what it is. Uh, I think Jessica Vidicus, if she can work on the the boxing a little bit more and just utilize the mix up, because she she took way too long to take the Silva down. She could have got that submission way earlier, but I'm very happy for her. I'm glad she got it done, and especially at 125, let's get some more uh, some more fucking talent in there. We're going next on the main card, Benenson or Hebero versus Kaya Machado. Kaya Machado outstrikes Benenson Hebero in every single round and loses in a split decision uh, after looking like shit. He looked like shit. He, the heavyweight dropping down to light heavyweight never never is a good sign, first of all. Usually you move up later on. Um, Jared Cannonier being the outlier. And Hebero uh, lands more power. It, it's Kaya Machado outstrikes him, but Hebero it, it makes the bigger reactions every single time. Hebero lands a big strike. Machado smiles and does something weird, like a very obvious tell that he's getting cracked, and and it didn't it didn't matter. Uh, Kaya Machado got fucked up, and I thought it could, he probably won twenty nine twenty eight, uh, especially in those last two rounds. But Brennan Hebero, uh, it could have gone either way, man. Uh, realistically, it really could have gone either way. I think Hebero. Uh, could have done enough to get it done. I think Kyle Machado needs to get the fuck out of the UFC. I don't think he deserves to be here at this point. He's lost three in a row in the UFC. Went from 8-1 and one to 8-4. and four, Losing to Mick Parkins, Dante Almeida, and now Brennanson Hibero. Dante Almeida's loss is just pathetic in my opinion. This is just absolute fucking atrocious. Mick Parkins isn't even that bad. But Dante Almeida is like, holy fuck, dude. What are we doing here? Good win for Benenson Hebero. He's never going to win another fight inside the UFC, probably. He's kind of shit. They're probably both going to get cut, honestly. It was kind of a trashy fight, but whatever. We're going to move on next on the co-main event of the evening. If you guys did enjoy this, make sure to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. We have Aaron Blanchfield versus Rose Nama Yunus. Uh, Rose wins the first two rounds very clearly, outstrikes Aaron, avoids the takedown threat, and then Aaron starts to put on the pressure, starts to put on the takedown, starts uh, in the third round, just takes Rose down, and Rose can't get up. Rose tries to shoot for a takedown on a wrestler and gets taken down for it. Aaron gains a lot of confidence, moves into the fourth round where uh, the ladies stand up and we're banging a little bit. Only 13 seconds, I think, of control time or 30 seconds of control time for Aaron Blanchfield. Uh, we're swinging, we're swinging. Aaron Blanchfield outlands Rose Nami Yunus, and now we're 2-2 leading into the fifth round where knows Rose Nami Yunus looks like she's giving up on the stool almost. She looks completely gassed. She doesn't look like she doesn't want to... She looks like she doesn't want to be there. Aaron Blanchfield looks very excited. Looks like she's having fun inside this fight. And Rose Nama Yunus comes out in that fifth round and gets taken down, and she just sits there. She doesn't move. She doesn't try and get up, and she gets up with no time left, doesn't do anything with it, and win or uh, loses the fight. Uh, very clear 48-47 unanimous decision for Aaron Blanchfield. Very, very impressive. Um, gets a win over one of the greatest of all time uh, at 125 or at 115. And it's just it, it's unfortunate to see, bro, because you're, you're, you're seeing – uh, an older fighter who's moving up in weight classes and, and can't compete with, with the top of the division anymore. She can't compete with girls who, who used to be below her not even fucking three years ago. Like, we need to go back to 115 at this point. Rose Nami Yunus, is, is, she's in a, a division where she's getting gassed too quickly with girls who are way bigger than her and, and are just wrestle-fucking her. She can't get up, man. She needs to work on, that, uh, on those... On those takedown defenses because we're clearly not getting up we don't have the jiu-jitsu to get up we don't have the sweets to get up we, we can't do anything Aaron Blanchfield was was in bad positions multiple times and Rose was not able to get up out of it and it was really unfortunate to see but it's uh, very clear that the new blood is here guys it's very 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 fucking clear uh, we're gonna move on to the main event of the evening again if you guys have not already make sure to drop a like and subscribe we have Brandon Moreno versus Amir Albazi. Very, very clear 50 45. Brandon Moreno. Um, Amir Albazi has no business being here. Him being a plus 145 was fucking generous. He was a, like plus 120 earlier in the week. Absolutely atrocious fucking like disgrace uh, of a look because Brandon Moreno did not deserve that. He deserved a minus 300 on this. Amir Albazi lost to Kaikara France last time around. Brandon Moreno beat the fuck out of Kaikara France. M MMA math, right off the bat, should have told you that Amir Albazi was going to have a tough night, first of all. This is going to be his toughest fight of his entire career, and having them even close is laughable. Brandon Moreno, obviously, was better in every regard, and he, and he showed it. 
He was better in the in the striking. He was better in the takedown defense. He was better in everywhere. Amir Abazi couldn't take him down. Amir Abazi couldn't impose any of his game plan. And as soon as his, he didn't get takedowns, he looked like he he was frozen. He had nothing left. Brandon Moreno was piecing him up, swole up his eye, pieced him up multiple times, rocked him multiple times, almost had him finish multiple times, and just showed out tonight. He really showed out and showed that he deserves to be at the top of the the division. He deserves another title shot. He deserves to be at that number one spot alongside uh, Brandon Roy Val, who he just had a close fight with. I thought he arguably won that fight. He was a close fight, 48-47 either way as well uh, for Roy Val versus Moreno. But but inside this fight, you see a, a Moreno who's still hungry for the title, who beat the fuck out of an Albazi who, who was riding up the division, man. He, he was undefeated inside the UFC. He was just moving as, as quick as anyone. And and he gets stopped by a guy who, who has sniffed the belt fucking mul- multiple times, has gotten it himself... And now, now we're like, we're back to it. We're back to, to Brandon Moreno trying to get that belt one more time. And I think he's going to do it, especially at 30 years of age. He has plenty of time. This kid has a lot of time, man, to make a, a, a big name for himself, especially at 125. There's a lot of shit he can do. Anyway, that's all I got for you guys today. Hopefully you guys did enjoy. Again, we will be doing the predictions and breakdowns for the Neil Magny versus Carlos Prates on Tuesday, uh, November the 5th. And uh, that's all I got for you guys this evening. Hope you guys did enjoy. I will talk to you guys all later. Peace.